call a city council meeting to order tonight. We have a quorum present. Tonight will be led in the invocation by Dr. Ron Tottingham from the Empire Baptist Temple here in uh, Sioux Falls. After the um, in invocation, we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance. So at this time, I would ask everyone to please rise. Our Heavenly Father, tonight, thank you for the privilege and joy it is to be able to be here. I want to thank you for the people who have been willing for many years now of my lifetime to bear the burden of this city and have made it what I consider one of the greatest cities in the world. And I pray tonight that you'd bless and you'd put your hand on things, whether people acknowledge it or not, is irrelevant as long as you do guide us in the way that we should go. So I pray you'd bless tonight in everything that's done in this city and the guidance of this city, that you would put your Holy Spirit on their lives and things that need to be said, that this city would still remain a great place to live. In this I ask in the name of Jehovah, my God, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, let's get started. Is there a uh, motion to approve the consent agenda? Knutza moved. Is there a second? Second, Jameson. Jameson seconded. Further comments, further motions? Seeing none, all in favor of approving the consent agenda will vote yes. Those opposed, no. Council members Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Venega? Yes. Brown? Yes. Costello? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Knudsen? Yes. Litz? Yes. All members present voted. The consent agenda has been approved 8-0. Is there a motion to approve the regular agenda? So moved. Benninger. Benninger moves. Is there a second? Second. Brown. Brown seconds. Further motions, comments? Seeing that all in favor of approving the regular agenda will vote yes. Those opposed, no. Council Member Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Benega? Yes. Brown? Yes. Costello? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Knudsen? Yes. Litz? Yes. All members present voted. Uh, that has been approved 8 0. This is a time we set aside a period of five minutes for anyone that wishes to address the council. We ask that they come up and give their name and their address. And uh, for five minutes, anyone wishes to address the council? Good evening. My name is David Zanakis. I live at 631 West 9th Street. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. I am the representative of two arts organizations, both of which have performances in the near future in Sioux Falls. The first of these is the USD Playhouse presentation of the Taffetas, and I've given you some information about it. The Taffetas was conceived by Rick Lewis. It's a delightful show focusing on four singing sisters from, we are told, Muncie, Indiana. They're making their national television debut, and the use of the format of the television variety show was a means of paying tribute to the sounds of old singing groups such as the McGuire Sisters, the Fontaine Sisters, and the Cordettes. The program is under the direction of Professor Charlotte Guyette of the University of South Dakota. Professor Bruce Ernest of USD serves as the musical director. USD drama students Jesse Atkinson, Anna Auchenpach, and Elizabeth Wright are joined by guest artist Darla Ernest. There will be three performances of the Taffetas at the Orpheum Theater June 20th and 21st at 7.30 p.m. and June 22nd at 2 p.m. On behalf of the staff, faculty, and advisory board of the USD Playhouse, it's my honor to invite you to attend one of these performances and to present you with a coupon good for a complimentary ticket. I hope you'll be able to attend one of these performances, the four youngsters performing are wonderful and the show is delightful. The other organization I represent is the Dakota Sky International Piano Festival and that is this card that I've given you. It is coming up on its second season of performances beginning July 17th running through the 31st. The Dakota Sky Piano Festival brings a series of classical piano recitals by six superb young pianists from around the world musicians who are on the threshold of international performance careers. Recitals beginning July 17th are on succeeding Mondays and Thursdays. 
The times are 7.30 p.m. They'll take place in the Balbus Re Recital Hall at the Washington Pavilion. In addition to the recitals, there will be a chamber music concert Sunday, July 20th, several lectures by composers and performers, master classes for area piano students given by the artists, and several concerts given for the region's young people. The level of playing at these concerts is very high, and I think you'll find that they'll be rewarding if you attend them. It's the hope of the festival to expand in the future to bring even more high-quality concerts to Sioux Falls featuring not yet widely known, but very well-trained young artists <coughs> from around the world. On behalf of our founder and executive director, Paul Sanchez, and the rest of the board of directors, I hope you'll find an opportunity to attend one or more of these recitals. I've included a small card that is good for a complimentary ticket to the concert of your choice. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, David. Appreciate you coming down. Others that wish to address the council for a period of five minutes? I just ask that you give your name and your address. Look around. I see no one that is coming forward, so we will move into the regular agenda for this evening. We have the first item is item six. And what, let me just say we'll go, we'll, uh, Tamara will read six through ten, and then we'll have the presentation, and we'll stop after each one. Um, for instance, when six is finished, we'll stop and we'll ask questions, and then we'll move on to seven. And it's the first reading, so we'll take as we normal do, normally do uh, one vote after we finish the, uh, after we finish the, the comments that have been made. So with that, go ahead, Tamara. Item six is a first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the revised ordinances of the city <coughs> by amending the schedule of rates to be charged by the City Light and Power Department for furnishing electric current for light and power purposes. Item 7 is a first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the revised ordinances of the city by revising Chapter 18 thereof to increase rates at the landfill in Sections 18 through 30A, 3 and 4, and 18 through 30B, 3 and 5, with an effective date of January 1, 2009. Item 8 is a first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the revised ordinances of the city, revising sewer utility rates and charges. Item 9 is a first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the revised ordinances of the city by increasing water rates. Item 10 is a first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the revised ordinances of the city by increasing permitted front foot street assessments. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Tonight we have one presentation that will stream through all five items. And as we go through these items, you'll see the results of the um, most recent rate analysis. As we've talked in the past, this is a cost of service rate analysis. And to allow us to do that, we look back at the previous year's performance. And then we also, as you know, the operating and capital budgets are coming forward. Those operating and capital budgets are included in the rate analysis. Um, when we have situations where we have debt service beyond the five-year capital plan, those are also factored into our rate analysis. You'll see that the five items that we'll address tonight are all on track with what we've told you in the past with the exception of one utility, and that's the light and power division, which is slightly higher than what was mentioned last year. Our schedule first tonight is the, for the first reading um, on June 16th. A week from tonight is the second our goal is to answer as many questions as we can for you tonight um, with the hope of not having to bring our consultants back for the second reading if uh, possible. One of the things that you'll see tonight, we've used the, consistently used the same consultants year after year to look back and also look forward to develop this rate analysis. You'll hear from DGR, RW Beck, A2S, along with the public work staff. As the resolutions read, these will all go into effect January 1st, 2009, and you'll see rate increases from all five uh, areas of public works. One of the things that you'll see is that, as you've asked in the past, that we bring these to you as a package in one night to have one intense night of presentations, act on them, and also to bring them prior to the budget adoption process, so not only are the uh, expense has been reviewed, but also the expected revenues are included in the uh, operational budgets. 
So to start off tonight, we've got our two presenters, Blair Metzger with DGR and Mike Burkhardt, the division manager of the Light and Power Division. Blair. Thank you, Mark. The first thing I'm going to do is go through a little bit of background and history of the Light Department to get everybody kind of up to speed on, on that. It's a little different uh, utility uh, from the other utilities. It's a very small utility in the, in the community. I have a, a, a slide that shows the, the territory that is served by the light department, and it's the green uh, background uh, area there, which is up by the airport, and a few minor pieces of property around the community besides that. But it's very small in, rel in relation to the size of the community. It's something to keep in mind, so when we talk about rate increases, it really doesn't affect a lot of people. But, but nonetheless, it is a, it is a viable and a, and, and a, a very, very good uh, municipal electric utility. A little bit of history on the rate increases and what's happened in the past. In 1994, there was an increase of 8 percent, and then nothing was done for, for 12 years until 2006, uh, at the very tail end of 2006, and then into 2007, there was another increase of 9 percent. Uh, last year, we were here and we asked for a 16 percent, so it, the current 2008 rates were raised to about 16 percent on average. Tonight we're going to talk about a 7% increase, and I'll get into the details of that in a bit. And then in 2010, we're looking at something smaller in the range of 3% as it stands right now. One of the things I'll keep talking about throughout this presentation is the, the issue of purchase power. Uh, the light department buys power and turns around and resells it to its customers, and, and the cost of, the, of that power has, has gone up dramatically. Your two power suppliers are the, the federal government, the Western Area Power Administration, which generates power from the Missouri River dams. They've had a drought out there, and that lowers generation, so they have to purchase power from elsewhere, which costs them more, which they pass on to you. And then also your, your supplemental power supplier is Heartland Consumers Power District, which is a coal-based generating utility, and they've had some increases as well just because fuel costs have gone up for them just like everybody else. So, so that's, a, that's a big issue, as it notes here, over 60% of your of the cost in the light department is power supply related. So something that we have to keep an eye on every year. And as it shows there, we plan to do this annually so we can kind of keep track of what's going on there. The uh, light department, again, I, I mentioned that it's, it's, it's a pretty small uh, territory. It's about 2,500 customers. Uh, there's uh, 1,600 roughly residential customers and then 375 commercial and 525 governmental. And the interesting thing to note is that over half of the sales are to public entities, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and, and there's a list of them on the bottom of that slide. Uh, the largest individual customer is a water purification plant. Uh, there's also several schools that are served, the Air Guard, uh, the Convention Center, Pavilion, and, and, and so on. And so a lot of these are, are uh, public uh, uh, customers. Lakeside Dairy and the Sheraton would be the exceptions to that in the, in the large customer uh, category. But for the most part, the large customers are public uh, entities, and in total, over half the energy is sold to public entities. As I mentioned earlier, there were, there were no increases between 1994 and 2006. We had a 9% in 2007, a 16% going into this year. As part of that, we not only increased the rates, but we also looked at rate classifications and did a cost of service study. So some of the rate classes actually saw increases more or less than the average. Uh, but we got through that last year, and so now going forward, we're going to be changing everybody's rates equally this time around. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. But it's going to apply to everybody the same no matter which rate classification they're in. This slide here shows uh, in stark detail what I mentioned earlier, and that's uh, the fact that 66 percent of the cost of the light department is related to purchase power. The big red blob there in that pie chart is purchase power. That's, and, and so it drives everything. In the past few years, as I mentioned, those costs have been increasing dramatically, which of course changes the financial picture for the light department, which means we need to change rates. The other categories are all fairly minor in relation to the uh, purchase power cost. As an illustration of that, the, the next slide shows, uh, I mentioned one of your power suppliers is the Western Area Power Administration. And this graph in here is just simply a way of showing you that if you look starting back in the late 80s and going through 2007, you can see what's happened to their costs. And again, it's primarily related to the fact that there's been 
a drought out west. And so that, that drives their costs up, which they in turn pass on to you. So the plan for 2009 is to increase rates across the board for each category of customer by 7%. Uh, when I was here last year, we talked in terms of doing a 5% increase, and as Mark mentioned, we think a 5% isn't going to be quite enough, so we're, we're talking a 7% increase uh, for 2009. One of, the, one of the comments that I need to make there is that the, the costs are, are uh, the, the, uh, the rates are cost-based. In other words, we're not trying to make extra money from the customers. We're just passing on those costs that you experience. Both of your power suppliers that provide power to you are the same way. The, the federal government, as well as Heartland, are, are nonprofit entities, and they pass on their costs to you as they have to experience them to make the power that they sell to you. So if there, there's nothing going on here. No one's, no one's trying to make extra money on anybody. It's just the fact of the, of the of cost. They're, they're going up, and they have to pass them on. So, And as I mentioned uh, a bit ago, all these will be applied equally to all rate classes. As far as the future, as it looks today, um, one of, one of the, the, the goals that we're trying to achieve is, is to get your reserves in the light department to a, a higher level than currently is there. Right now, you've got about a million and a half dollars in reserves. We like to see it about three and a half, which would equal about a half a year's worth of expenses, kind of a nice number that's typically used for municipal utilities to have that much in reserves. A reasonable number, not too much, but, but gives you some cushion. We're not there now. We'd like to get there. We're not going to do it in one jump. It's going to take several years to get there, but that's our goal is to eventually, if we can get through some of these increases that are driven by power supply, we'll try to get to that level. As I mentioned earlier, we're in, in 2010 and 11 and 12, we're looking right now at about a 3 or 4% increase, which is fairly, I guess we would consider to be reasonable in this, in this day and age and we're hoping we can stay with that. A lot of it, again, will depend on what happens with power supply cost. In addition to what we will do in terms of looking at, at uh, the rates themselves and the, and the, and the, the level that they need to be at is, is we, we plan to look at the cost of service again next year as your costs shift around, especially your power supply cost. We need to take a look at that to make sure we're charging each rate class an appropriate amount. We may also consider a power cost adjustment clause which would sort of put on autopilot some of the, the power supply pass-through costs. Uh, both the uh, Western Area Power Administration and Heartland have that feature that if they experience higher costs, they can automatically pass it on. We may want to consider that here. And then finally, one of the, the big items that the light department does in addition to serving its customers is it maintains the streetlights in the community. And, and some of, the, some of the way that the cost of that is, is, is uh, being collected is, is not exactly perfect. And we like to think in terms of maybe making some adjustments there to have all the, rate, all, the, all the citizens of the community pay some of that instead of just the rate payers. So that's something we may look at in the next year. So the bottom line summary for the light department is, is, is uh, uh, captured in this slide. And that is that 7% again is the increase, and it's the same for all customer classes. What it means to the typical residential customer, their current bill is, is something in the uh, area of $42 a month. That would go up by 7%, which is about $3 a month, uh, approximately. Small commercial customers, the average customer uh, has a bill of about $200 a month. They would see an increase of around $14 a month. And then large commercial customers, uh, it, it varies depending on how efficiently they use electricity, but. In any case, they'll go up 7% each of them, which, which a typical customer, I just picked a couple of them out there that have bills in the $1,500 to $1,700 area, they'd be going up slightly over $100 a month. And as I mentioned earlier, we do plan to review these annually to try to stay ahead of, of, of changes, in, in especially power supply costs. So is there any questions that I could try to answer at this time? Kermit and Bob Litz. Yeah. Can you uh, give us some indication of how these rates will compare with XL? I mean, I would say that they are slightly less than XL. It would, of course, depend on which class of customer we're talking about. But residential, they'd be slightly less. And small commercial, they're quite close, though. They're not real far off. They used to be quite, quite a bit lower. But right now, they're 
I would say slightly lower, within 10 percent probably. And also uh, one other question too. Uh, here in 2008, uh, can you briefly say something about the philosophy of having a municipal um, power company? As to why why that's that's yes. typically done? You mean? Um, well, generally, it's it's a it's a you know it's a public service that everybody needs, uh, and historically, those communities that have done it themselves instead of being served by an investor-owned utility have experienced lower rates than having an investor-owned utility do provide the power. So, um, I don't know how many there are in South Dakota, but there's a number of the communities, the you know, Brookings and Pier and, and Watertown, and several of them have their own utilities, and so it's a little different here. You have a pretty small customer base relative to the community, but uh, those communities that have done that have been able to do it at a lower cost and, and it equally reliable and, and, uh, and it's been a good thing for those communities. It's been, it's been a good thing financially for them. I guess what I'm saying is that uh, most of the city cannot take advantage of this, mm -hmm. uh, whereas a small number of people can take advantage of this. Is the, the, per, the, the reason for that is because there's a, a, a legally defined service territories that were put in place. And so once those were put in place, you can't change. Uh, I, sh I shouldn't say it quite. There, there, are, there are mechanisms to add to municipals, but they're difficult to accomplish. Uh, so you know, it is what it is because that's what it was defined back, I think, in the 70s is when that was done. And it just so happens that in this case, you were serving a pretty small area, and that's what it ended up being. Now it's growing. I mean, you, it's a nice size utility. I look at, uh, I have a lot of municipal clients, and this is, you know, as large as a lot of them are. It just happens to be small in relation to the community. It's kind of unique, but, but it, as far as, it's a, certainly viable. And it's a you know, nice, you know, in South Dakota, I would guess it's well, certainly in the top ten of municipal utilities. It's probably in the top five, would be my guess. So. And just one other quick question. Uh, I think some time ago uh, we asked about the assets of the municipal, you know, the power company being around 25 million. Is that is that about right? I I don't know that. Is that oh. Do you know that, Mike? <coughs> Mike Burkhardt, like superintendent of public works. To give you an exact number offhand, I would I I would I couldn't give you right now, but I'd estimate uh, 21, 22 million. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's. Thank you. Uh, say, uh, uh, can we go back to the impacted purchase power uh, pie chart that was shown earlier? Mm -hmm. Right there. Yeah. Now, you know, I was looking at this here, and uh, the depreciation, which was your second largest uh, cost on here, I was curious, uh, what is the depreciation exactly on, and how does that play into the financial picture for a municipality? It, it's it, what it what it represents is the depreciation recognized on assets. So all the substations, power lines, transformers, all all those type types of things uh, would be depreciated. Um, it, it's a non-cash expense, so that you don't need to have cash there to to uh, pay that off, so to speak, to cover that expense. But as the year goes by, they also spend money on additional capital things. Okay. So a uh, few years ago, they built onto the substation, for example. That was that was what I wanted. Yeah. To and then they sure. buy, you know, transformers if there's a new customer, and then that kind of thing. So very good. So that's sort of it's an a capital. It's, it's a capital okay. expense related. Yeah. You're you're accounting for what's going to happen in the future and the expenses that you're going to pay. Is that is that be a safe yes. summary? Yes. Yep. Very good. Okay. Thank you. General. Uh, Blair, just have a couple of questions. Number one is we're all pretty familiar right now with the conversations about reserves. But anyway, 50% um, seems to be a, a significant percentage compared to what I would expect would be normal. Can you tell me why 50% is the going rate, so to speak? Uh, it's probably a function, I suppose, of, at least as I think about it, is, is, is what you think your biggest exposure is in terms of what, what could happen that you need to have some cash for. Uh, and it also would, of course, depend on how big your utility is. The bigger it gets, probably the less important it is to, to have that. In the case of the, of the light department, you could, if you think about the worst possible scenario of a tornado hitting the substation, for example, you could be faced with a uh, several million dollar expense there that you'd have to come up with cash to buy new transformers, for example. You know, they're, they're over a million dollars a piece. So, so we're, we're trying to get to a level there where we think is is enough there that if you had that happen, you'd have some flexibility. 
we wouldn't have insurance for that kind of expenditure? You, you, you may have. I guess I'm not sure what, what the city carries for insurance. That, that may, you may well have that. The other question I would have is if, if you maintain a 50% reserve, what's the um, analysis of having the automatic power cost adjustment also with that same kind of balance? Of 50%. That's, that's a good point. If you get, if you, if you were at the point that you could absorb some increases without adjusting rates, you, you would not need it as much. Right now, we could see power costs swing enough that we could really re re eat into those reserves, and so right. that's a good point. Okay. It's less important. Uh, if you, some people have a rate stabilization fund, they call it, where they have it sitting there, and as, as rates go up, they just eat into that reserve and that would work as well. But right now we're kind of at the skinny edge and we like to see a little more there just to be comfortable. I would also be curious to find out what kind of insurance coverage we would have before we see this on the second go round. Okay, is that something? Okay. Other question, Pat? On the um, WAPA power, we're, can you refresh my memory from last year? We're allocated as a city so much WAPA power. Yep. And if we were to divest ourselves of our electric company, mm -hmm. what would happen to that allocation? You would, you would lose that. You would not be able to have it. You must be a, a public entity to get that power. And so uh, by maintaining our public entity and that public entity maintaining the streetlights across the city helps the rest of the city benefit yes. from yes. that. Yes, have access power. to that very, very low-cost power. Okay. Then uh, regarding the follow-up on, on Gerald's question on the reserves, when you calculate your six months or 50 percent of the budget uh, for a reserve, does that um, give consideration to the fact that we have reserves for many other utilities and the likelihood of needing a reserve in all those utilities at any one time? Is the, answer, the short answer is no, but it's a good point. We, and we have talked about that because you're right. I mean, it's not, it's not as if if something happens, you can't come up with the funds somewhere else. And so. We, we haven't got into that detail a lot because we've been just trying to keep ahead of, of the power supply costs and maintain a minimal reserve. I think it's a good point that we will need to have that discussion going forward because you're right. You wouldn't have to necessarily in every fund have that much money. Your analysis only considered this particular enterprise. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and, it, and it, that's always a target that we set, uh, we try to set with staff, and so it's something we can certainly discuss, and maybe we don't need to go there. We don't need to go that high. Then, in order, uh, we're not. We're only at a million and a half. We want to get to three and a half. At the present course, how, how long until we get to that? I think five years. Okay, it's going to take us that long to get there. And then, with regards to the uh, implementing a power cost adjustment clause, does that? Do you typically see that in utilities that go through the rate adjustment every year, like we do? Or is that some, you know, where they set rates and kind of forget about it? Or? That's a good, a good question as well. Uh, if you do it every year, you probably don't have to. The only thing you're, you're at a disadvantage is if something happens mid-year that's really significant and you don't want to do it, except for every year you could have a situation where you but it, it, it. And again, if it were something significant, we could always take action sure. at that time. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, okay. That's a good point. Thank yeah. you. Other questions? No, thank you very much. Let's go to <coughs> seven. Good evening, Councilor Mayor Dave McElroy, Sanitary Landfill Superintendent. Tonight I have with me Matt Evans from RW Beck, our solid waste consultant. Matt Evans, RW Beck. Uh, in 2005, we began working with the city um, uh, in developing a tipping fee model for the rate analysis. Uh, the model projects both expenses and revenues uh, going forward at the landfill. Uh, expenses include uh, construction projects, uh, O&M expenses, which include wages and benefits at, for landfill staff, um, as well as operating expenses, fuel, um, and other maintenance expenses. Utilities is also included as expense. Um, revenues come for, to the landfill through um, tipping fees, uh, waste that's disposed of at the landfill, um, and also we'll be including uh, the, the revenue from the landfill gas per or selling the landfill gas to the poet ethanol plant in 2009. So those are included in, the, uh, in our landfill tipping fee model. Uh, and again, it's, it's important to note that it's an enterprise fund at the landfill, so it's self-sufficient. It's solely supported through the revenues um, from, from landfill activities. <clears throat> 
So what we're recommending on January 1st, 2009 is the increase of MSW fee and the CND tipping fee by $2. Uh, the MSW tipping fee will go from $30 to $32. Um, out of area for the MSW will be increased to $96.50. Uh, CND will be increased from uh, $28 to $30. And the uh, construction and demolition debris for out of area will be in increased from um, up to 9650. Uh, this, these, these were based on a review and update of the tipping fee model. These are consistent with what we, what we projected um, and presented to you in 2006 and 2007. And in the past, we presented uh, these regional tipping fee, MSW and CND uh, bar charts, comparing us to regional facilities. Uh, we've updated this, and you can see on the MSW, we are tracking in the mid um, or lower mid range. Uh, regional tipping fees increased by approximately a dollar um, through through our uh, research and into what the other tipping what the other facilities were charging for MSW and C and D. Uh, the regional tipping fees for C and D here, you can see, we're tracking towards the middle of the of the chart, and again. We've uh, tried to get a good, good handle on the regional, um, the regional pricing here. So historically, as I said, we've presented some of this to you before, uh, and we're tracking uh, along with this. The, uh, we've had several step increases over the last couple of years as we switched out of the, as we're moving from the unlined active MSW area and into a lined um, uh, landfill collection, landfill cell. Um, and we're projecting a dollar increase uh, next year. Um, we'll be reviewing that. We've had one project come in uh, under, considerably under budget, about a million dollars under budget. And uh, assuming that project goes through, we'll be reviewing and seeing if we need to do this um, dollar increase next year, as we're projecting. So what does this mean to the residential collection um, or to the residential customer? Uh, current household collection rates we have estimated at are approximately $22 um, a month. And, if, and what we've assumed and feel is a, a fair assumption is that 30% of that is from the tipping fee at the landfill. And if you increase that by, t so if, the increase, if we increase the tipping fee from $30 to $32, it has an effect of increasing the, the monthly garbage bill from $22 to $22.44 approximately. So you're looking at about a $0.50 cents per month increase for the residential um, customer. So the bottom line for 2009, uh, we're projecting a $2 uh, tipping fee increase, which is a, brings us to $32 for MSW at the landfill and $30 for CND. And then out of area, which again, it's a five county regional landfill, if it comes from out of, out of that area, it's a $96.50 per ton increase. Take any questions. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, just for the, I guess mostly for the public, uh, but for a reminder for us too, will you please tell us what MSW stands for and oh. C and D? Yes, MSW is municipal solid waste. That's your normal garbage that goes into the landfill. And then C and D is construction and demolition debris, and that's sometimes you've heard the uh, term rubble. Um, that's what those are. Pat, I just a uh, question on the uh, the fee increases across the board. On the it seems like the um, in area increase is a higher percent than the out of area increase. You basically on the uh, construction and debris, it's two dollars a ton for both, and and the same for municipal solid waste. What was the rationale in not keeping it proportionate? The out of area? Yeah. The, the, the out of area, area, I don't think we really received much out of area waste. It's, so. it's just too high. So it's just kind of being consistent with it, I guess, with the $2 increase. Further questions, Kermit? Yeah, you mentioned that the recommendations for next year's increase are consistent from what you mentioned in 2006 and 2007? The, actually, next year's is $1 higher than we were projecting a flat rate for, of 32 next year, and we've increased that to 33. Okay. How, go ahead. But then also, too, we're going to be selling gas. Mm -hmm. Can you 
tell yeah. us how this is factored in? Yeah, we've included that in past tipping fee projections as well. Um, and that's, we're assuming a startup of the gas pipeline project of J July 2009. So that's, that's factored into that. Well, okay, but in the future, mm -hmm. isn't it possible we'd see a decrease in rates or the rates would not increase because we're going to be selling that gas? Yeah, that mo the model previously that, that we've done in the years past has included that gas revenue also. Oh. So we've had that in there and... Um, we're, yeah, so, we're, so, so so you've known about this gas for since 2006? We've been working on this. Well, I think the first that we've included the, the revenue from that was last year because we, at that time, were working on that and, you know, wanted to include, oh. in, include it, so. Okay. Because we really didn't know very much about this uh, on the council mm -hmm. until it was presented to us. Formally, yeah, I don't know if you want to add anything there, Kevin. Good evening, Kevin Smith with the Office of Public Works. I believe that project either showed up two years ago or possibly three years ago in the capital improvements program. And as Matt pointed out, we were hopeful that um, we would be able to include um, revenue from the gas sales to offset additional. Um, major adjustments with the landfill rates, but I don't believe we ever presented the landfill gas project as something that would eliminate the need for all future rate adjustments um, out at the landfill. But it, it was in previous versions of the capital improvements program. Well, I guess uh, I guess I'm kind of surprised by that because we hadn't even signed a contract with poets, and we're including all of that in these projections. Well, that was part of the financial planning process of that we go through with the CIP for anything for which we receive revenue, whether it's water sales or landfill gas. When you don't know you're going to have it. And that's why we were very cautious about not being overly optimistic about um, any gas sales, certainly. Uh, it does strike me as a little odd that you would include the uh, uh, revenue from the land sale gas in your rate study without a customer. But then I'm wondering, did you include the costs for the pipeline and, and the infrastructure for that in your rate study as well? That was all included, yes. Further and question. They, um, if, if I could just finish, Mayor. Um, we did, they were just estimates, Pat. Yeah. They, and I would say they were um, ultra-conservative estimates at that. Uh, we did look at different business models such as the city owning the pipeline, the city not owning the pipeline, Poet or let's say um, Customer X owning it, um, but it, it all had to be built in on some level just for planning purposes that the intent was never to build the pipeline to simply um, give away the landfill gas. So R.W. Beck did include some modest uh, conservative estimates on what we could receive. Further questions? Uh, thank you. Let's go to eight. Steve Burian with AE2S. Uh, Trent Lubbers, uh, Water Reclamation Division Manager. Mayor Munson, members of the City Council, um, I appeared before in a similar capacity. I will be presenting twice tonight, once for Water Reclamation and once for the Water Purification Division. Starting out with Water Reclamation, we did complete an exhaustive study back in, in 2006 with your Public Works and your Water Reclamation staff. And looking at that, we completed a, a comprehensive cost of service analysis for the different user classes within Water Reclamation. In addition, we did a 10-year pro forma um, projection of revenues expenses in order to determine the revenue adequacy of the utility. Stepping back for a minute and just looking at 2007, at this time last year, we made recommendations to you on rate increases for, 2000, um, for the 2007 year, or for 2008 based on 2006 performance, and so it's always healthy to look back. You can see for water reclamation that they actually perform well in all areas where their operating revenue and their other income was slightly higher than their budget. Um, similarly, their operating expense was quite a bit lower than their budgeted expense. 
and their capital outlay was even um, lower than their budgeted capital outlay, which resulted in a pretty significant increase in the cash reserve for the water reclamation utility. Um, just one thing to point out is the capital outlay, although it looks very positive, really was the result of deferrals more so than it was something that was eliminated. And so those are the types of things that will likely come back in future years and need to be covered as a result of those deferrals. In terms of our looking at this time last year, we did make, had made a series of, of projections on where the water reclamation utility needed to be. These are the increases that we recommended to you and then you adopted for your different user classes. You have a residential user class, a commercial, um, industrial, which includes meter, flow, strength, and, and, and strength. And then you, have, you do serve three entities outside of the city, Renner, Prairie, and the city of Brandon. And you can see that those rate increases varied from anywhere from 19 percent up to a high of 26 percent. And for the city of Brandon, it last year, or in this year, you had no increase. And the reason for that is not that they weren't warranted one, but your contract with them only allows you to increase their rates every other year. And so that, and these all are based on the cost of service analysis, hence the differences for each of the user classes. What we adopted several years ago was this somewhat comprehensive graphic to try to show you the overall picture of the, of the water reclamation and the water purification utilities. This is the one that was, was adopted last year for water reclamation. And you can see on, on the top, if you use the, the right y-axis, you have the percentage increase um, act, either actual or projected for the out years uh, with time on the x-axis. And then across the, the left y-axis, you have dollars. And, and the top line is the total of all your reserves that we recommended that you accumulate over the time. The, the one below that is just the operating reserve, which we've set at 90 days of operating reserve or 25 percent of the year. And then the green line is the total, or the green bar is the total cash that you've accumulated to offset those reserves. And you can see that through these rate increases that we recommended last year, you were required to use cash somewhat creative to, creatively and to the point in the out year where in 2012 you were, were able to reach all of the different reserves that you had targeted. If we move forward now to the presentation of, of looking forward to, to next year in 2009, we did complete a new revenue adequacy analysis for nine and beyond. In doing that, we had your latest operating cost projections in your capital budgets. Um, we, did have, we did look at a little bit of debt service for this utility for a revenue bond for the Eastside Sanitary Sewer Satellite Treatment Land Purchase in 9 and 10. We, looked at, we spread those costs over two years, but for bond efficiency, we looked at selling only one bond to accomplish that. We do have updated current cost recovery estimates for this utility. And then because your revenues were slightly higher than, than what we projected, we did up that baseline a little bit in terms of revenue projections organically from the utility before rate increases. If we look specifically then at the increases for next year, and these are consistent with what we presented to you last year at this time for the 2009 projections, we're looking at, at differentiating percentages again in terms of the, in relation to that cost of service analysis. For residential, that would be 18 percent up to a high of it looks like about 22 percent for some of the other user classes throughout the city. If one wants to look at the same information but then look at what it means in terms of the impacts on specific meter charges and flows, that's what this table accomplishes. So you can see, for instance, the residential meter and flow are projected to inc are recommended to increase 18 percent each. As a result, your residential meter would go from $1.90 to $2.25 for a 35 percent inc 35 cent increase. And then your residential flow in, in, in units of 100 cubic feet would increase from $1.79 to $2.12. And you can see the similar relationship for some of the other user class aspects across the city. That does continue then on to the second page where we look instead of just at flow and meter charges at some of the industrial strength components that you have within the city and then the recommended rate increases for the three outside entities for which you accept wastewater discharges. This then is, is a new projection. We've looked a little further out there and you can see that it's actually a little more optimistic than what we were presenting last year based on some of the performance. We've also dissected the reserves a little bit to be more demonstrative of the increases or the reserves that we recommended to you. So in this line, once again, the, the, the individual line with percentages are the either actual recommended or projected rate increases from now, from 2008 through 2016. 
And you can see what we're actually recomm recommending is 18% for 2009 for residential. In 2010, we're actually seeing a dip from what we recommended historically. It dips quite low down to as low as 4%. And then with some of the capital improvements that you've deferred that are out there in the future years, we do have that jumping back up to 8% in the furthest planning years of the, of the planning horizon. With this shaping, you can also see that we're able to do a pretty good job in terms of, of, of managing the cash. You can see that the, the green line, the green bar, which is the unrestricted cash reserves, which covers your operating balance, your rate stabilization fund, and your capital fund that we've recommended, dials in really nicely in the out years, hovering right around that recommended red line. Um, just for a reminder, the operating reserve we're recommending is 90 days. For the rate stabilization fund, we're looking at 5% to your operation, maintenance, and debt service. And then for the capital reserve, we're recommending 15% of your capital improvements plan. Maybe a little bit more attention to that last one. When you built the wastewater treatment plant with federally funded dollars, you were forced to, re to create a restricted capital improvements fund, which is actually the blue bars on this graphic. And as the plant has aged, Trent has, has had to dip into that fund more aggressively to keep the plant up in good condition. That was recognized when we completed this rate study but instead of recommending that you dump dollars into a restricted fund that would provide you with very little flexibility, we actually recommended that you create that, that fund that goes from the brown to the red line. And so that additional green from the brown to the red is meant to accomplish the same thing as the blue bar that's on here. It was just meant to be done in a less restrictive way for the city of Sioux Falls. Uh, much like the previous presentation, we always try to make sure to do a good job of benchmarking for the, the city of Sioux Falls. And before you get alarmed, this is actually a two-page presentation. Your benchmarks there are a five-state area we looked at in terms of South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota, Montana, and Wyoming, which is the 2008 or the survey that we do annually pro bono for the benefit of our clients. We look at a, at a flow of 7,500 gallons or 10, 100 cubic feet per year. Um, the blue shows the meter charge, the green shows the um, volumetric charge, and then the sum obviously would be the, the number listed on the right. You can see that this is right out of the box, this is, or right off the, the press, this is the fresh 2008 rate survey of all the rates in the region. And you can see that if, if nobody in the region increased their rates in 2009 except for Sioux Falls, you can see that you jump from about the third, third way point in, the, in this to about the 40th percentile if you consider the two-page analysis of all mechanical wastewater plants in the five-state region. So you're still right where you kind of want to be in terms of rates across the region. Uh, we also just to show a little bit of history here, and I guess maybe what's important to show here is that with some of the early year low increases, you did get in a little bit of hole in the water reclamation utility, and we recommended some pretty aggressive increases to get out of that. Probably the more important and positive message of all this is we have hit the peak in terms of what we're projecting some of the increases to be. And in, in 10, we, we project that to be somewhere around 16%. And then we, we looking at the graphic previously, we're recommending that those increases will get quite a bit lower than double-digit increases moving forward. In addition to our final recommendation here that we continue to review these rates annually, we think this is a very proactive process for the City of Sioux Falls Water Reclamation Utility. We also like to always try to show the bottom line using a similar volumetric discharge of 7,500 gallons or 10, 100 cubic feet. You can see that the recommended 18% increase will result in a monthly increase from 1985 to about $23.42 for an increase of $3.57 for the average residential customer within the city. At this point, I'd be, Trent Rye would be glad to take any questions that you have regarding this utility. Questions of Stephen? Okay, see no one, go on to <coughs> nine then, Steve. Good evening, Randy Jansen, Water Superintendent. Mayor Munson, Member says Council, moving on, I guess in a very similar process to water purification, it might look somewhat repetitive just for a different utility. This study was completed in 2005 rather than 2006, so this was actually the predecessor um, analysis that we did for the city, and it also looked at a cost of service analysis for your varied user classes as well as a 10-year projection. If we look at the performance back in 2007, 
Here you can see that revenues actually were slightly less than what we projected, but that was offset by a higher than budgeted um, other income. On the other expense side, or the expense side, you can see our expenses were quite a bit lower than what the budget, showing some real good um, controls by Randy and his staff. On the capital outlay side, the, the costs were just slightly higher than the capital outlay budget. And for a total, you'll see that there was a net increase in the, in the unrestricted cash balance as compared to budget for 2007. At this time last year, we had again made a series of recommendations, and, and you adopted the ones that we recommended for 2008. Um, again, the cost of service showed that there was an, some inequities within the utility. And so there weren't differing rates across the, the, the user base. And you can see here that the recommendations that you adopted varied from 6.1% on the low side for Lincoln County Rural Water to a high of 18% for the commercial and meter and flow. And you also can see if, if you relate to dollars better than you relate to percentages, you can see on the right side of the graphic here some of the resulting dollar amounts, such as a 21 cent increase in the residential meter charge within the city of Sioux Falls. The graphic, the, I guess, comprehensive demonstrative graphic actually originated with water, and this is the one that we presented to you for water in 2008. Here we have three different bars that we, we track, the operating reserve at 90 days. Because your cost for ultimately purchasing water from Lewis and Clark will be a little bit higher than, than the, inc the incremental cost of making water within the city, we did recommend that you create a rate stabilization balance in the event of an extreme drought, so you have some additional dollars available to cover some of those costs. And then because the bond payment to Lewis and Clark is a pretty substantial amount of your water utility, we do track that independently in the green. You can see there's a series of increases with 13.5% adopted in eight and a recommendation of 14.5% in nine. You can see that we've, we've been on and are staying very close to your operating reserve in the years of the analysis but we are, it's taking some time to, to um, create the rate stabilization fund. It does seem like we've generated an alarming amount of cash in 2011, but 2012 is a very significant year for the Sioux Falls Water Purification Utility. And so if we had gone out further at this time, there would have been some very serious needs for those cash in 2011. If we move on to 2009, we'll again have your, your updated budget projections for 2009 as well as an updated capital improvements plan. We've implemented the current cost recovery projections for this utility. And in this case, we did decrease your revenue projections organically a little bit to reflect the actuals for 2007. And looking forward to next year, we are recommending increases consistent with what we presented to you last year at this time. Again, on a differentiated basis with a residential meter and flow at 14.5%, um, higher for commercial and industrial. And then for Lincoln County and, and, and Lewis and Clark Regional Water System, we're, represent, we're recommending only an inflationary increase for that user class. The Lewis and Clark Regional Water System is really a new class for you in which you'll be selling water to Lewis and Clark and they'll in turn be helping to wield that water to, to the small communities within the vicinity of, of Sioux Falls. This is then the updated projection looking forward. And you can see, again, we've projected it out quite a few years into the future. Um, 2009, again, is the peak. Uh, in 2010, we're recommending a similar, projecting a similar increase. And then there's a series of about 10% increases in 11, 12, and 13, after which we feel we can significantly de decrease those percentages in the out years. Um, again, with those minor increases in the out years, by the end of the planning horizon, we should have built the, the recommended rate stabilization fund that we've created for you. And you can see how the blue is, is bouncing around a little bit as we use cash prudently within the utility. Uh, this, your benchmark is quite a bit smaller for water because you have a surface water system. We do try to benchmark against like systems. These, the, these are the surface water systems in the five state area that I mentioned previously. Again, this is the 2000 rate, 2008 rate information hot off the press. And if, if only Sioux Falls were to increase their rates in 2009 and no, everybody else maintained their rates stable, which isn't likely to happen, you can see you'd be at about the quartile point for like systems in the region. Um, very similar to water reclamation, you can see a historical perspective. We did start raising rates pretty significantly back in 06, and we've had a series of those increases. Probably, again, the positive story here on this table as well as the graphic is that it appears like 2009 is the peak, and 
we'll have one more pretty significant year in 10, and then we'll be able to start lowering some of those increases moving forward. Certainly wanted to be cognizant of the bottom line for water. If we look at 7,500 gallons or 10, 100 cubic feet, if you accept the recommendation of 14.5% for residential, you'll see your rates increase from 21.79 to 24.95 for an increase of about $3.16 for the average residential customer. Because we're doing both water and wastewater, if I take my bottom line from the previous graphic, previous presentation, and couple that with this one, you can see that we're looking at about a $6.73 increase for if you accept both the recommendations for water reclamation and for water for purification. And then because our, our benchmark is, is pretty broad, we, we tried to end the presentation by bringing it down to what it means to you in some of the bigger cities in South Dakota. This is a 2008 current rate information and if Sioux Falls was the only utility to raise its water reclamation rates and its water purification rates, you can see that you'd go from almost the bottom of the table to somewhere around that quartile to the one-third point within the communities in South Dakota. With that, uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present, and, and Randy and I will be glad to answer any questions that you have. Questions to Steve on um, item nine. Gerald. Um, Steve. With the average rate adjustment of 14.5%, can you help me understand why Lincoln County and the Lewis and Clark is only at 3%? One of the more significant revenue requirements or expenses that we need to push through the water utility is the Lewis and Clark project in terms of your payments to them. Because both of those entities are, well, Lewis and Clark is Lewis and Clark, and T and Harrisburg are both members of Lewis and Clark, the recipients of that Lewis and Clark water and North Lincoln is also a member of Lewis and Clark, the cost of service model does not, none of those costs are assigned to those, member, those people that you're selling the water to, and so as a result, their increases can be much smaller than the increases internally. They're paying, in essence, they're paying their own cost, like you are, to Lewis and Clark to handle their membership in the system. Further questions? I'm not sure I have the right answer, <laughs> or I have an answer, but I'm not sure I understand it. Um, don't we have an agreement, Kevin, with Lewis and Clark and with Lincoln County? Yes, that's correct, but um, under the terms of the agreement right now, uh, the delivery would end either in 2012 or when Lewis and Clark Rural Water arrives. So I think what Steve was saying was they're not going to benefit from um, the Lewis and Clark Rural Water Systems water delivery to the city of Sioux Falls. So we think it would be, um, you know, a bit disingenuous to charge them for Lewis and Clark costs for which they won't uh, derive a benefit. And by that I mean the pipe costs and the treatment plant costs. We certainly could, um, but it, you know, to us it's really a fairness issue. Yeah. You know, it did go into the cost of service analysis and unless, or I should say if the um, agreements between the city and Lewis and Clark and Lincoln Rural Water and T and Harrisburg go awry. Uh, I would be the first one to revisit that issue. Thank you. Other questions, Kermit? Yeah, I, I guess in response, I mean, our water plant is a business. We're supposed to be making money. And um, because we're talking about really a substantial difference between Sioux Falls residents and, the, and Lincoln County. Well, I mean, I get, we're supposed to be making money. Okay, okay we're so, giving yeah. up money here. Councilmember Steggers, I don't know that that's necessarily true in that, you know, much like the previous presenter indicated that all of these analysis are based on cost of service analysis, where we're looking at cost causative elements and we're looking at where we can assign those cost causative elements to the people that are creating them. And so in the event that if, if when Lewis and Clark Water gets here, and these people that we're, we're planning to serve are going to be now be served directly from Lewis and Clark. They're not part of the cost causative factors for the Lewis and Clark service to Sioux Falls because those costs are only for the capacity that you've asked for for your municipality. And so it would be very you know, difficult to defend passing those costs on to these, these additional users that you have in the absence of them benefiting from the costs. It's called negotiation. I mean, we were in a very good position there. Well, I, I think you could apply that philosophy 
across the board. One of the reasons we have a cost of service based philosophy when it comes to all of the rates, whether it's water or wastewater or lights, is because if it costs us less to produce um, the commodity for that user class, they should be billed fairly. And uh, if you look at what Blair presented, not to go back in, into the light fees, commercial users pay less or pay a different amount because of demands and the impacts on us and our distribution system uh, than residential customers. And in this business, I consider Lincoln Rural Water a wholesale customer, just like John Morrell or any other large consumer of water. And, and all we're trying to do is um, come up with a fair rate so that when Steve and I have to go talk to their board of directors, we can tell them you're being charged fairly for what it costs us to deliver water to you. I guess I would say they're an outside entity. John Morrell's is right in Sioux Falls. It's, the residents are right here in Sioux Falls. Businesses are right here in Sioux Falls. They're and an outside entity. And some of Lincoln Rural Waters customers are right here in Sioux Falls as well. Yeah, also, I do have a question. Um, in projecting these increases, I just assume you're also projecting that we're going to be uh, selling more water. Is, is it? So uh, oftentimes we, we talk about conserving water in Sioux Falls, but in reality each year we are selling more and more water. And what, do you, uh, what is the number that you're using for the increase in water use, I guess? Mayor Munson, uh, Councilmember Staggers. What we looked at is, is we looked at two different increases in terms of organic growth for revenues. Because the city is growing, I'm going to say, nominally around 2.5%. We've been using 2.5% just for meter growth because meters, you're going to sell a meter each time a new house comes into the city. Because of your conservation plan and because of the fickleness of Mother Nature as it relates to water demands, we're only looking at a 1% increase in water usage each year compounded annually. And so we have two growth rates, 2.5% for meters and 1% for water consumption. Go ahead, Pat. Um, Steve, regarding um, the rate for uh, Northern Lincoln Rural Water and Lewis and Clark, when okay, the Lewis and Clark, um, we don't figure their costs into it because they're not going to benefit. How does that is that similar to the logic that we put water mains up and down every virtually every street in the city of Sioux Falls, but we only distribute to one point for nor Northern Lincoln yeah, Rural Water? I, guess I didn't answer the f the full question. You know, when we look at cost of service, we look at a whole variety of things. The supply really is shared similarly. The treatment is shared similarly. When you get into the distribution and transmission system, we did cut off your, all of the 16 inch pipe and, and smaller are considered distribution mains within the city and all the mains larger than 16 inch are considered transmission. And so when we went to allocate costs for North Lincoln, we only allocated transmission costs to them because they're not benefiting from those, relatively speaking, smaller pipe within the city. Exactly. Question for Kevin. Kevin, in the past we've talked about how we don't control the conservation efforts in, in Lincoln County. Um, is there anything built in to encourage that? Well, if, if you look at the majority of their users, and I, I'll say T in Harrisburg, they actually have more rigorous watering restrictions than we do. So um, for those urban customers which we're trying to reach with this uh, agreement, they are doing what they can. Um, and I would certainly encourage them to to employ the other uh, rebate programs that we do as well. Uh, it, it has not been something that has been mandated, but um, since I'm here, uh, yeah, I would strongly encourage it as well. It's, it, it has made an impact on our per capita usage of water. So even though because we're growing and we have more people and we will use more water on a per capita basis, we're, we're, basis, we're actually using less. And I think that's really the, the true test of whether conservation is working or not. Further questions? Not. Thank you very much, Steve, you. Kevin. Let's go to 10. Good evening. Galen Huber. I'm the manager for Street Utilities Division for the Public Works. Just a brief history on, on the uh, street frontage foot assessment. Uh, a little over five years ago, there was a study that was done to determine how 
the cost of operations within the street division could be offset by revenue. And so the study came up with a, a formula on starting in 2005 with 10 cent per front foot assessment, um, and that would go for five years. This is the fifth year of that five of that of the study that recommended um, 10 cent increases over the next five years. And so for 2009, what, what the request is, is that we increase it by 10 cents, so it go from 90 cents to $1 for a front foot. One of, the, one of the major impacts on my budget is um, the cost of asphalt. And you can take a look at, this is a 10-year history on what it's cost the city uh, per ton for asphalt. Now, as you can see, in 2008, we had a slight decrease, which doesn't seem to want to follow what the economy is doing here. But I believe there might be a reason for it. I'm guessing there is. Most of the a asphalt companies <coughs> or will, will know by history what they need to have on hand right after the first of the year, and they start purchasing their oil at that time. We bid this really early in the late winter, early spring, and we got a really good price on this. If you take a look at bids that have been let by the city in the last couple of weeks, the price of asphalt has increased dramatically. I believe, and this is just me, I believe that you will, I will see an uh, increase in cost of asphalt uh, in the coming years. A couple reasons for that. One is crude just hit the uh, all-time high on Friday. And, and I don't know if anybody knows when it's going to tail off or level off or if it's going to decrease on me. So I've got to believe they're going to pass that cost on to, on, to, on to the customers, which are the people that buy asphalt. The second thing is within the refinery business themselves, they have refined their technology down so they can take more fuel out of each barrel of crude which leaves less oil for the companies that produce asphalt. So supply and demand will tell you that that's going to increase the cost also. So that's why I believe that this 10-year chart will incre increase over the next couple of years. Um, and I hate to speculate beyond that. But um, that's the impact that it has on the asphalt. Now, I have a two-fold effect. I am also the largest uh, fleet division within the city of Sioux Falls. I have more rolling stock than any other division within the city. I have to get out onto the street to do my job, and the increase on, on the fuel price is also impacting my budget dramatically uh, for fuel also. What you're seeing here on the left-hand side, I have basically three programs with, that, that fall with underneath my street division. And if you take a look at, this is my proposed uh, operating budget for 2009. If you take a look at the bottom, uh, that is the street maintenance, the cost of street maintenance. And if you take a look at the red or the maroon in the center, that is the flood control. I'm in charge of the levy. And then if you take a look at the yellow above, that is the cost of doing snow removal for the city of Sioux Falls that I incur. If you go off to the right, those are the expenses. If you go off to the right, those are the, those are, that is the revenue that I receive within my division. If you take a look at the bottom, which is the green 4.3 million, that is the revenue that I receive through the front footage assessment. If increasing the front footage assessment by 10 cents would give me additional revenue of around $380,000. So by increasing it from 90 cents to a dollar, uh, that revenue would, would increase by $380,000. But if you can still, if you, if you just take a look at just my street maintenance cost, and you take a look at the revenue, there's still disparity on what it costs me to do the work and, and, and the revenue that I receive um, to, do the to do the job. Are there any questions? Questions again, D? Galen, regarding your comments on asphalt, I know, I think it was Friday's USA Today, there was a fairly large article about um, saying that the asphalt, um, price of asphalt around the country has increased 25% in the last year. And, um, and then I think there was a smaller article in our local paper today on that same topic. But do any cities in the Midwest or even the country, do they, are they starting to think about building roads with anything other than asphalt? Um, actually, the, city of, the state of California is using recycled tires. And they're grinding that up and they're putting it into their mix. And 
I, I just read this article last week, and I can't tell you the, exactly the percentage, uh, but they've had very good luck on, on doing that. Now, again, California and South Dakota climate's a little bit different, so I don't know if that rationale would work here in South Dakota. The, the, the um, thaw frosting, uh, frost thaw process within uh, the South Dakota um, isn't very favorable to, to asphalt roads all the time. So I'm not sure what it would do if we would go with some type of other material, but yes, there are other materials being used out there, and California is using recycled tires. Yes, uh, Galen, you, you, you mentioned here that your revenues do not meet your expenses, and so the rest of your revenue comes from the? The general fund. Um, also, too, um, this is a program that's supposed to end this year. This, uh, are you planning maybe to bring a ordinance for continuing it maybe in the upcoming years? I, you know, I think it's premature to say right now what, what we're going to do. Um, these, this revenue that we're projecting is based on 2008. And plus, I don't know what I'm going to be paying for fuel next week, much less next year. So I think what we're going to do is, if this is approved by the council, what we do is we take this into this fall and winter and take a look and do a study again to uh -huh. see where we want to go with it, if we need to go anywhere with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? Galen? No, thank you, Galen. Appreciate it. Okay, Mark. Okay, Mayor and City Council, um, just to do one slide in summary, this is a slide that we created for you last year. Um, at your request to just look in total if you were a light sanitary landfill sewer and water customer what the impact would be per month and again our light division has just over 1600 residential customers but if you were um, a light customer your total monthly increase would be just over ten dollars a month um, however most of our forty six thousand um, water and sewer customers are not and so essentially um, it's just over seven dollar a month seven dollars per month uh, rate increase impact for what we would certainly consider these are vital city services and delivered at a very um, respectable rate and then the last is the annual increase on the front foot assessment and that would be for the additional ten cents which would be an impact of an additional eight dollars for a given lot. Again, our goal was to go through these as a package. We've appreciated the fact that you allow us to take you through these as a package one time per year. And we are available to answer any questions um, yet tonight or even throughout the week um, so we can maintain the schedule for you of the second reading next week. Are there questions of Mark or any of the presenters at this time? Not. Is there a motion to approve items 6 through 10 for the second reading of Monday, June 16th? So moved, Brown. Brown moves. Is there a second? Second. Let's. Let's second. Further comments on the motion to set the hearing date for the second reading? Seeing an all fair setting the hearing date for June 16th for items 6 through 10, we'll vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. Council Member Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Benninga? Yes. Brown? Yes. Costello? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Knudsen? Yes. Fitz? Yes. All members present vote. The hearing date has been set for June 16th, right? 6 to 10. Let's go to 11. Item 11 is a resolution, resolution vacating a portion of County Auditor's Lot H2 Southwest 14th, Section 3410150. Good evening, Chad Heavey, Office of Public Works, Engineering Division. This portion of the H lot is located in the northeast corner of 57th Street and the Ellis Road and is unimproved. The petitioner is John Brook of Equity Homes. The land has been annexed into the city and the petitioner plans to incorporate this land into his residential development. We are retaining 50 feet of right of way on both Ellis Road and 57th Street for future build out. The petitioner has complied with the right of way vacation policy. Engineering recommends approval. Questions of chat on item number 11. Others that wish to address the council? Not as a motion to approve. I Move so for approval, Benninga. And Benninga I second uh, Councilor Benninga's motion. Knutson seconds the motion. Further comments? Motions? Not. 
All in favor of approving item 11, vote yes. So it's or no. Council Member Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Jenniga? Yes. Brown? Yes. Costello? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Knudsen? Yes. Litz? Yes. All members present voted item 11 has been approved 8-0. Item 12. Item 12 is a resolution approving the special assessment rule for constructing sidewalk on various streets and avenues in the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, after receiving complaints regarding the lack of portions of sidewalk in certain areas of the city, property owners were requested to install the sidewalk. Um, what they completed uh, is what they completed. And then it, through a city contract in 2007, the uh, city had sidewalk installed. And this is the, the assessment portion of that. Sidewalks were installed on the east side of Cleveland Avenue between 22nd Street and 26th Street. The north side of 12th Street, east of Lyons Boulevard, and on Jamie Circle, which is just north of the Westward Hoe Country Club, west of the Big Sioux River. Eleven properties will be assessed, a total of approximately $24,000. Questions to Chad at item number 12. Kermit? Yeah, Chad, uh, you mentioned that these came about because of complaints. Is that right? Uh, Correct. There is... Um, um, it was a lack of, there were several areas that had sidewalk, and then there was just small portions where sidewalk was missing. And then we received complaints uh, regarding the, the lack of that continuity. So, so, so somebody just calls in and just makes the complaint, and then we kind of go out and take a look and see if that's correct, and then we... We've, right? we've done an inventory of all the sidewalk in town, so we know where sidewalk is missing. Yeah. Um, we appropriate dollars every year to do this, uh, this installation. In this case, when we receive numerous complaints, um, the priority of those uh, sidewalks, then they become a higher priority. Yeah. The reason I'm asking is because, I mean, I know a lot of locations in Sioux Falls that do not have sidewalks. Correct. A lot. <laughs> yeah. Which is, you know, if the property owners that are adjacent don't want it, that's okay with me. But uh, at the same time, we don't seem to have any consistency at all. I mean, for example, McKinnon Park. I mean, it, it's not ringed on the four sides with sidewalks. Um, I, I guess I'm just, you know, interested in this inconsistency that we have. We're going to be having these people pay $24,000. Why aren't we having the city putting sidewalks on the east and west side of McKinnon Park? Uh, it is a priority-based um, ranking, and uh, there's, you're correct. There's several areas in town uh, that do many. not have sidewalk. Yeah. And we, um, every year, we go through and install a certain portion of sidewalk. But we, you know, we don't have the... But the city's not on this list here. I mean, there are areas that the city has that do not have sidewalks. We do uh, sidewalk repairs and installation on city facilities every year. Okay. Sure, Gerald. Uh, Chad, I, I just want to tell you I'm very happy to have you have this completed. As you well know, you and I have talked about this Cleveland and East 26th Street for six years. Uh, the only way we're going to increase the number of sidewalks that are going to be built is to increase our budget for this line item in our budget. And after the sidewalk was built, and I can tell you that I received many complaints about this, um, I actually, for the first time in my six-year history, got many thank you notes from property owners thanking you and the city for getting this done. So I just want you to know publicly that I appreciate your extra efforts in making this happen. Thank you. Bob Litz. Uh, Chad, I, I noticed there's uh, three parcels that uh, Gregory and Terry Shipper have there that total up to about 8600 bucks. When we do this, uh, is it a year-long process between the time we notify them that we want sidewalks? And no, they, they were notified, I'm in a, I, I think, in about 06. Okay, so it's been a substantial amount of time to get ready or have somebody else do and it. And they, um, I believe in this instance, they um, had told me they were going to be developing that property along Cleveland. Um, but we just moved forward with the installation and nothing's been developed along there at this point. So Very good. they, Thank you know, probably had two years notice. Okay. That's, that's what I want to hear. Thanks, Chad. Further questions of Chad on item number 12. Kermit? Yeah, Chad, on the information we have here, it has down the fiscal fee for each of these uh, uh, adjacent property owners. Correct. That's just that engineering? Engineering, uh, 15, advertising. Is that 15 percent? Uh, I believe in this case it's 14. 14 percent? Okay. So the city, it looks like, is making some money here. 
Uh, there's, you know, there's costs associated with putting the project together, advertising it. Um, we're out uh, doing surveys, inspections, um, to make sure it's getting installed correctly per standards. Further questions of chat on item number 12. Further questions? Others who want to address the council on item number 12? Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Let's, let's move. Is there a second? Second. Benninger. Benninger seconded. Further comments on the motion to approve? Seeing none, all in favor of that motion will vote yes. So suppose vote no. Councilmember Staggers? No. Anderson? Yes. Benninger? Yes. Brown? Yes. Costello? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Knudsen? Blitz? Yes. All members present vote. Item 12 has been approved. Six yes, one no, and one excused. Item 13. Item 13 is a resolution approving the special assessment role for constructing sidewalk on the east side of Southwestern Avenue from West 57th Street to West 69th Street. This sidewalk was installed in 2007 on the east side of Western Avenue between 57th Street and 69th Street. Two properties will be assessed a total of approximately $7,200. Per city ordinance, properties with direct access to an arterial street are assessed for sidewalk costs. Questions on 13. Others that wish to address the council on item 13. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Let's, let's move. Second. Second, Jameson. Jameson seconded. Further comments on that motion? Seeing none, all in favor of that motion will vote yes. Those opposed vote no. Councilmember Staggers? No. Anderson? Yes. Benega? Yes. Brown? Yes. Costello? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Litz? Yes. All members present voted six yes, one no, and one excused. Uh, has been approved. Item 14. Item 14 is a resolution approving the special assessment role for construction of grading, gravel, curb and gutter, sidewalk, storm sewer, asphalt surfacing, water main, and street lights on West 22nd Street from South Discovery Avenue to 120 feet east of South Monticello Avenue. This portion of 22nd Street was constructed in 2007 by Oliver Excavating for approximately $286,000. Per city ordinance, the north property will be assessed approximately $138,000 of these costs. The city will attempt to collect the remaining assessable amount of approximately $138,000 from the developer of the south lots. Questions of Chad on item number 14. Pat. What's, what's the attempt to recover? What's that about? Uh, the developer of the lots on the south when those lots were platted, they signed a, an assurance agreement uh, that basically says they will complete um, the infrastructure improvements required with this development. Um, and at this point, they have not. So we are not going to assess or try to recover those costs from the property owners. We are going to attempt to recover those costs from the developer. Who is the developer? Um, I believe it's the Ertz family, or I think that's right. Further questions on 14? Others? Is there a motion to approve? Move for approval, Benninga. Benninga moves. Is there a second? Second, let's. Let's second it. Further comments on that motion? Seeing and all in favor of the motion to approve, vote yes, so suppose vote no. Councilmember Staggers? No. Anderson? Benega? Yes. Brown? Yes. Costello? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Blitz? Yes. All members present have voted. Um, got what, what, one, five, is that right? Yeah. Two, you, I know you know. One, two, three, four, five, five yes, one no, and two excused. Uh, that has been approved. Item 15. Item 15 is a resolution advising and giving consent to the appointment of members to certain citizen boards. That, that's one that uh, we're br we brought in that uh, just came in. They just uh, got the uh, people to that are appointed to it, so it's just kind of uh, put. We needed somebody on, on those boards, and so uh, we just got the uh, name. So that's why that's here for you. So I don't know if you have any questions on the appointments or not. Not. Is there others that wish to address the council on item number 15? Move not. for approval, Benninger. Benninger moves. Is there a second? Second, second round. Round seconded. Further comments? See no further comments. All in favor of the motion to approve item 15 to vote yes. So those opposed vote no. Councilmember Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Benega? Yes. Brown? Yes. Costello? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Knudsen? Yes. Blitz? Yes. 
All members present have voted. Item 15 has been approved 8 0. Item 16. Item 16 is a resolution to approve three historical markers on city property. Um, good evening. Brent O'Neill representing planning staff. Uh, these markers are requests from the Minnehaha County so uh, Historical Society requesting uh, two markers be placed in city right of way and one in the city park. Uh, they've gone through a review of the Board of uh, Historic Preservation and the Parks Board on the one that would be in Spellberg Park. I would answer your questions. Any questions time. of Brent on item number 16? Others that wish to address the council on item number 16? Not, is there a motion to approve? I move for approval of item number 16, Knudsen. Knudsen moves, there's a second? Second, let's. Let's second it. Further comments? I see no further comments. All in favor of the motion to approve item 16, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. Councilmember Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Benega? Yes. Crown? Yes. Costello? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Knudsen? Yes. Let's. Yes. All members present vote. Item 16 is approved 8 0. Item 17. Item 17 is a proposed resolution vacating lot A except that part lying south of a line extending east from the northeast corner of H3 extending to a point lying approximately 133.16 feet south of 57th Street along the west edge of the old dirt road of Highway 115 extended, currently Sunny Mead extended in the north one-fourth of Section 10150. This unimproved right-of-way is on the south side of 57th Street east of Minnesota Avenue. The petitioner is Robert Visser. A utility easement will be maintained. Mr. Visser plans to construct a small building east of his current facility. Questions of Chad, item 17. Bob Litz. Chad, what's the, what's the nature of the building he wants to put up there? Um, he, he did a, put a tremendous model together. I asked for a site plan, but he gave me actually a very nice model. I should have brought it tonight. But it's going to be a small, I believe, 1,500 square foot um, uh, maybe the bottom will be an art studio. Uh, the top will be some other type of facility. He's planned um, a windmill to provide some supplemental electricity. Uh, there's a lot of solar power um, on the roof. It's more of a, a green building. Very good. Thank you, Chad. Kermit. Yeah. In the past, I've asked this question. I'm just going to ask it again. Uh, is there? We've been vacating a lot of land recently. Uh, is there any way we can ever get compensation for this land we're giving away, in effect, free? Well, we, you know, the land that we do vacate goes back back on the tax roll. Yeah, so we are. We can get it back on the tax roll and maybe get some money too at the same time. As you know, for. You mean? If I we, mean, this is free land, really. We're giving up. Typically, the land goes back to the 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 land uh, that I know, dedicated I, it. Yeah, but. What, I understand. Is there a state law that prohibits us from getting compensation from land that we vacate? I would. I can't answer that. I would. Okay. I can look into it. Oh, thanks. Well, that's, but Chad, in most of these cases, isn't it true we took the land in the first place? Yes. Okay. Thank you. It's probably through a dedication. Pat. Chad, um, on vacations like this, both sides of the uh, uh, street have to approve of the vacation. Um, yes, all, the only adjacent property owner here is actually city right-of-way. There's city right-of-way on the east of it. There's city right-of-way on the south of it. So Mr. Visser was the only one that had to sign the petition, and we will be having a uh, neighborhood meeting regarding this. So the city right-of-way will still continue from Sunny Mead all the way through to 57? Um, could you go back? Yes, we will continue to have some right of way. However, there is um, several utilities in Sunny Mead when we will be, most of that property will be, uh, will still maintain a utility easement. The, the only reason I ask is that I was aware that, or I was in the impression that the neighbors to the east were opposed to any vacation there, but so I got a little caught off guard with this. Well, when um, Mr. Visser has been, I think, approached us several years ago regarding this, Last year, in discussions with him, we um, developed some options um, of things, uh, possible portions of that vacation that we would support. Um, this is one of the options, and we will be having a public meeting or a neighborhood meeting. Um, and then uh, in July, I will be reporting on what happened at the public meeting. Thanks. You bet. Further questions? 
If not, let's go to 18. Item 18 is a proposed resolution vacating East Section Line right-of-way in Southeast 14, Section 4101-49 from South Exhibit right-of-way of East Amadon Street to 415.47 feet south. This unimproved right-of-way is just south of the intersection of Cliff Avenue and Amadon Street. A utility easement will be maintained. The petitioner plans to use this land for development. Questions of Chad and 18. Chad, Chad, looking at what's out there, uh, you know, why don't you come further south to the monument with this too? I mean, that's it's an unusable road, isn't it? Um, the, but this is what the petitioner uh, requested to be vacated. Does he own the whole parcel in that area, or is that maybe another lot that he's? I believe he does, but I believe there is some um, reversionary issues with that land. Um, so it's we we. I brought this forward a couple months ago, and it was a very complicated process with the state involved. Now um, we feel this is a um, less complicated process. So very good. They may be coming forward in the future to vacate some more. Further questions of Chad on 18. Kenny, Chad, do you know what type of development that the owner is looking at doing up there? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think we've seen any site plans, but I believe maybe the Sioux Empire Development owns that, possibly. Further questions of 18? If not, is there a motion set the hearing date for items 17 and 18 for July 14th? I so move Knutson. Knutson moves. Is there a second? Second, let's. Let's second. Further comments on the motion set the hearing date? Not all in favor? Vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. Councilmember Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Seneca? Yes. Brown? Yes. Costello? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Knudsen? Yes. Litz? Yes. All members present voted. Item 17 and 18. The hearing date has been set 8 to 0 for July 14th. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Litz. Litz moved. Is there a second? Second, Brown. Brown second. All in favor? Vote yes. Opposed no. Councilmember Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Benega? Yes. Brown? Yes. Costello? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Knudsen? Yes. Litz? Yes. We stand adjourned.